All right, well, we are here at the Boston Fed with Boston Fed President Eric Rosengren. Thank you so much for joining us today. Nice to be here. All right, so let's get started just with the conference uh, the past day and a half. We've been talking about the theme, which is a house divided, uh, kind of economic, geographical-based disparities in, in certain regions. Um, wondering in terms of as a policymaker, right, on the monetary policy side of things, how do you think Fed policy can address what's been seen as kind of a, a divide in the equality of whether or not everyone's recovered from this uh, economic recovery over the past 10 years? So the typical monetary policy tool, which is changing interest rates, can't be targeted to specific parts of the country. So in terms of just general monetary policy, we probably can't. But in terms of we do have a community development group that focuses on those parts of, for example, in Boston, the New England region, that's not performing nearly as well, so we are able to do that. And we also do a lot of research, which can be used by branches of government that can do more targeted work, including at the state level, but also at the federal level. Now, it was mentioned uh, even just in the last panel that just wrapped up, uh, you know, Larry Summers talking about the idea that there's maybe a moral hazard with Fed policy because you know, raising wages in San Francisco might have a more aggregate impact than in West Virginia, say. So is there a way that the Federal Reserve can make sure that the impact of its policies, I mean, given what you just said, it's kind of difficult to do that, but um, make sure that the, the uh, aspects of those policies are actually being transmitted across the country equally? So uh, we change interest rates, and those interest rates are national interest rates. We don't charge a different interest rate in San Francisco than West Virginia. Right. So in terms of the distributional elements, um, Certain parts of the country are affected differently by higher interest rates. Okay. So if we raise interest rates, something like autos is not going to do nearly as well. So there are distributional effects of what we do. But our job really is to get it right for inflation and unemployment. And we have to leave the fiscal policy to get the distributional part of the equation right. Right. Now, but at the Boston Fed, you do have some programs that you can do to, I mean, especially since you are in contact with a lot of these people right. in the district, uh, programs, right, to address maybe some small programs with grants, right? Could you explain a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, we have a working cities competition that uh, started in Massachusetts, now being applied in Rhode Island and Connecticut. The idea there is that one of the ways we can get communities to do have a better outcome is that they work together in a collaborative way and not all communities do that well. So it's the government working with business leaders, working with the nonprofit sector. The funding comes from actually national uh, foundations as well as states and large businesses. And it's been pretty effective at getting some of these communities to be starting to tell a better story. Right. So let's shift back to the national picture. I uh, kind of want to get your economic outlook given the, the jobs data that we got yesterday, lowest unemployment rate in over 50 years. Uh, average job gains have been above 170,000 over the past 12 months. And wage growth, however, kind of ticked down to 2.9%. So a little bit of a mixed report. Uh, what's your outlook uh, given that? And it, does that mean that Fed policy has been effective over the past 12 years where the tightness of the labor market is right now? Well, the labor market is definitely tight. So 3.5% on the unemployment rate is quite low. I think the payroll employment was a little bit weaker than we were hoping. But as we get to very tight labor markets, you can't expect necessarily that the payroll employment is going to continue to grow nearly as fast. So in an economy where we already have a pretty tight labor market, you're starting to see GDP grow around 2% or a little bit less. That's an environment where we're going to expect slower payroll growth, and that's exactly what we're seeing. So I think a lot of the debate is whether the slower payroll growth is a natural outcome from the fact that we're getting down to very tight labor markets, or is it reflective of possibly an economy that's going to get a good bit weaker? So there are certain elements of the economy that are definitely worrisome. The manufacturing sector, the export sector have definitely not been doing as well. Uh, that's a result of the trade and the global slowdown. Um, but other areas have been holding up pretty well, and I would highlight consumption in that. Mm -hmm. that uh, the consumer has been one of the reasons why, despite very weak investment and weak exports, we nonetheless have an economy that's been growing around 2%. So given what you just said about kind of how you might expect employment gains to temper a little bit, would you say that your expectation is for employment numbers for the rest of the year to kind of maybe be at lower levels than, say, the hot first six months that we saw? And secondly, does that mean that you have expectations for GDP growth to then also, also temper? So my own expectation for GDP growth is around 1.7% for mm -hmm. the second half of this year. So that's roughly what we think potential is. Uh, that would be consistent with the unemployment rate staying about where it is right now mm -hmm. and maybe inflation ticking up a little bit more from where it is, but it's already below our target. 
So core PCE is at 1.8. So I would expect over time we're going to get to a 2% inflation rate. But it's actually a pretty good outcome in a world, you know, when you think about what the Fed's supposed to be focused on, we're supposed to be focused on maximum employment. We have an unemployment rate at three and a half. We're focused on getting a 2% inflation rate at core PCE is 1.8. We're pretty close to where we want to be. That is an environment where I would expect the payroll employment to actually gradually be a little bit slower, mm -hmm. but consistent with staying where we are. So with that in view, in view, you also mentioned the manufacturing numbers kind of not being so great on the kind of negative maybe side of the, uh, of the economy. So would you not support another rate cut if there were to be one on the table uh, for the October meeting in a few weeks, um, given what we've seen especially this week with services and also manufacturing numbers? So I'm not going to pre-commit to, uh, <laughs> we, we still have some more data to get before we get to mm -hmm. the meeting. So I think this is a period where we should really get the data right up to the meeting and then make a decision based on what we're seeing at that time. So a lot of it depends on do we continue to see consumption being reasonably strong. There are reasons to believe it should be strong. So personal income's been growing pretty quickly. Stock market's still pretty high. Housing prices are still going up. Labor markets are pretty tight. Uh, initial claims for people unemployed is still very low. Those are all conditions that you would expect actually pretty strong consumption. The real question is whether the consumers start getting more concerned about some of the headlines they've been seeing related to manufacturing and exports. We haven't seen that to a great degree to this point, but if that were to happen, then I'd be more concerned. If that doesn't happen, then I'm more confident we'll be growing around that 1.7%, in which case there's not nearly as much of a need to do something. So uh, on that point, you would need to see some deterioration in the consumer-facing data. Uh, now, is there a concern that maybe that's too late? I mean, that seems to be kind of the dividing schools of thought right now between those who do and don't support rate cuts right now is whether or not you want to preemptively cut. So would it be too late if you wait until the consumer data starts to go sour before you make a further accommodation? So we've already eased twice, <laughs> right. um, and so right now where our federal funds rate is around 1.9%, that's the short-term rate that the Fed uh, targets. Uh, we think that the federal funds rate in the longer run is going to be closer to 25 mm -hmm. So we already have pretty accommodative policy, and it takes a little while for monetary policy to have an impact on the economy. So one of the reasons to kind of sit back and wait and watch is to see whether we have sufficient amount of accommodation now or not. Hmm. And so I think we're going to have to continue to watch the data right up to the meetings and then make decisions at the meetings. So watching the data, it seems like people are looking at the data a little bit differently. And the last uh, FOMC on the dot plots, there were five members who appeared to not have opposed, or rather who appeared to have opposed uh, the rate cut then, and then seven members who see a, you know one more rate cut maybe by the end of the year. With the divide that large on the FOMC, and you've been at the Fed for some time, how difficult is it to, to make sure that you're not only agreeing on what the policy should be, but also communicating that in a way that the public and the markets can understand. So we certainly should be able to communicate uh, what our policy is, but we also shouldn't communicate more certainty than there is. And I think it actually is important to have dissenting views. And I dissented at the last meeting, <laughs> right. so I obviously think it's important at some times to uh, dissent. Nobody complains about a Supreme Court justice who has a dissenting opinion. I actually think it's an obligation of everybody who sits at the FOMC that if they disagree with the policy, they should state why and explain why. And you may win, you may lose, but uh, the important thing is that all the issues get on the table. And as a group, we have to come to a conclusion. Um, but I think everybody's very respectful of different viewpoints, and I think that's an important component of getting the right monetary policy. I mean, how fierce is that debate, though? I mean, if we have three Reserve Bank presidents dissenting on, 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 a, on a decision, and it seems like maybe the, the, the governor votes are more powerful in a way. I mean, that's just the optics of it, perhaps. I mean, is there a concern that maybe too many dissents, even if it's still a minority, does represent maybe a bit of a fractured viewpoint on what the actual underlying data is? I think the important point is that everybody comes together in the end, mm -hmm. but all the views are expressed and expressed as forcefully as people think is appropriate. I think that does happen. So there is, we sometimes have contentious meetings, sometimes <laughs> they're not so contentious. Turning points in the economy are times where people are going to disagree. And so the incoming data up to now haven't been all that bad. Really the debate is about some of these risks. Do these risks pose a likely outcome or do these risks pose something that's a risk but probably not going to happen. 
And it's easy enough to disagree on those, and that's the kind of debate that you have to have. So one risk is uh, that you flagged in your recent dissent was uh, a WeWork kind of office sharing structure where there's short-term leases and then these special purpose entity structures that might actually present exposure to commercial real estate. That's something I hadn't heard before. You flagged leveraged lending before, but CRE was kind of a new one. Uh, why is that a concern for you? And is that something that contacts specifically in Boston have kind of raised as a, hey, this could be a, a real bad situation? So it's not specific just to Boston. Uh, shared office space occurs in many major cities right. around the country. It certainly happens in Boston, so there's a lot of shared office space in Boston, uh, but it's not Boston specific. I think the challenge is that uh, these kind of models rely on long-term leases, but then uh, provide space to people on a shorter term basis. That's kind of the financial stability issues that we've had at right. other times where we have a mismatch between assets and liabilities. Mm -hmm. And you worry about in the next recession, uh, the types of people that would not renew their lease would be some of those same people that are in shared office space that are on one year or shorter time horizons. And as a result, a lot of that space would become vacant all at the right. same time. Um, so normally if you're renting out a building, you have different tenants, it's staggered. That it doesn't all happen at the same time, but if everybody's in shared office space, you actually have it highly correlated, that's a problem. Right. And, and lastly, uh, there's been a lot of headlines going on right now. You mentioned that earlier in the interview. Um, curve inverts for the first time since 2007. New York Fed moves to contain repo markets for the first time since 08. ISM manufacturing lowest since 2009, all years that people don't want to hear. So what is your message to contacts in your district in terms of these worries about a recession? Is it really eminent? Is it an issue? Should people be preparing? Or is the U.S. economy still strong and that it's, it's, it's all right for right now? So my modal forecast is for a reasonably strong economy, mm -hmm. that we're actually going to see growth around potential, that we're going to continue to see tight labor markets. Frequently, when I talk to people in the New England area, they're talking about the shortage of labor and how hard it is to get people if they want to expand. How do they get people uh, that can do the jobs that they want? Mm -hmm. So. It's surprising that I actually don't hear from many of my contacts in, in this district as much about the concerns. I actually hear more concerns about the fact that it's so hard to get labor. That's very consistent with a very tight labor market. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not that people aren't being affected by the tariffs and the trade concerns. Um, we may not be as affected as some other parts of the country, so that may account for some of the difference. But my overall expectation is that the economy grows strong enough uh, we don't have a recession and that labor markets remain tight. So the concern isn't necessarily recession induced, but more trade induced for kind of. So the trade definitely affects certain sectors of the economy. It certainly affects manufacturing to the extent that uh, the price of your manufactured good goes up in the country that you're trying to sell to. And it also affects farmers who are actually being affected by the retaliation. We don't have a lot of agriculture here and mm -hmm. our manufacturing's not disproportionate in New England. Right. So as a result, it's probably not as big an issue in this district. All right, well, a great conversation. Boston Fed President Eric Rosengren, thank you so much for sitting down with me. Yeah, thank you to talk.